But it's true. Sometimes the most seemingly insignificant things in life have such great significance. You know, the truth of the matter is we could probably, if we wanted to, look back to the life of Jesus, that probably on a bigger scale at the time, at the moment when he was doing what he's doing, probably seemed largely insignificant to a majority of the known world. Seemed really important to a bunch of guys that were following him, but then when he was taken to the cross, most of those guys disappeared and ran away, so that seemed probably fairly insignificant to them as well until they encountered the resurrected Jesus. Then the significance of the previous three years probably kicked in and they realised, hang on a second, there's something doing here. You know, there's something going on here. I remember years ago preaching in a, in, in a, a church and um, I'm digressing here, but it's okay. It's, it's, my, it's our birthday party today, so we can digress. Um, I remember preaching in a church many, many years ago and I was, I was talking about my journey to Christ. I came to faith at 19. But my first encounter with God would have been the age of 12. I went to a grade six class at Evans Head Primary School. And I was in there and this lady comes in and she's teaching these bunch of 12-year-old kids about Jesus. Fast forward years and years later, nothing much came of that at the time. But fast forward years and years later, I'm preaching in a church and I'm sharing this story about this woman who, when I was 12 years of age, did something that to her probably seemed fairly insignificant. She just got a bunch of young kids together in a classroom, tried to tell them about this guy called Jesus that apparently lived and died 2,000 years ago. When you're 12 years of age, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And it certainly didn't capture me because Jesus wasn't holding a football. He wasn't fishing, nothing like that. So all the things, it was just a story. But I know that the Word of God is powerful. I know that a seed was planted there. 19 years of age, I come to faith. I'm in this church, I'm preaching, and I'm talking about this lady that all these years ago uh, shared at Evans Head Primary and talked to me about Jesus. Well, fair income, at the end of the service, a man comes up to me, and he goes, you're not going to believe this, I know that lady. I said, really, what's her name? And he told me her name, Jennifer Strong. And some of you in this room might know Jenny Strong. He said, Jenny Strong was the lady. And I said, that's right, I remember the name, that was her. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home and I'm going to ring up Jenny and I'm going to tell Jenny what I just heard from you. And I said, please do, because I never got a chance to thank any of the people. How many of you haven't had a chance to thank the people along the journey that have invested into your spiritual growth? A lot of people have invested into my world, some unknowingly, some knowingly, but most of them never got a thank you from me because I didn't understand at the time and some of them are out of my life now and I couldn't find them if I tried. But I praise God for those people that did something that seemed really insignificant. Because there's so much significance in the seemingly insignificant things of life. And so he gets on the phone, he rings him up. The next Sunday, I'm, at, I'm back at church and he comes up to me. He goes, let me tell you a story. I went home and I rang up. And he said, I said to her, you're not going to believe this. There was a young gentleman and he was in a class in grade 12 when you were talking about Jesus. And now here he is and he's preaching in a church. And he said she started bawling, crying on the other side of the phone. And when she pulled herself together, she said this. She said, me and my husband were just sitting down and we were just talking about all these years, all these years we spent investing into kids in schools, going into primary schools and teaching religious education to these little kids. We've been doing it for most of our life, all these years, and we were questioning, God, what was the point of all that? What was the point of all that? And while they're having this debate and this question, they get a phone call. Guess what? One of those seeds grew into maturity. And guess what? Everything I'm doing, guess what? The fruit of everybody here, you can say a prayer for Jenny Strong. If, you, if you're a part of this church, this gathering, and you appreciate what's going on, you feel like you're growing, well, guess what? That seed went further back than me and Jackie. It went back into the likes of a woman called Jenny Strong who invested into us, and it went further back into somebody that invested into her and so on. The truth of the matter is what you and I do today has the potential to change generations to come. Not just moments right now, generations. And we've got to live and think like that. The faith that that produces in you when you start thinking like that, you can do something today in somebody's life that can alter generations. I'm not just speaking to you. Young people in this room, I'm not just speaking to you. If, if these seeds take root and you make changes and adjustments and you press into Jesus, then I'm not just speaking to you. I can have an impact on your children, your grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren right down through the line. You see, somebody spoke to me about Jesus once. I wasn't living for Jesus. I wasn't walking for God. I wasn't raised in God. I wasn't, but they invested into me. 
And so now what I do is I raise my children, I try my best to plant seeds of God into their life and my hope and prayer is that they're, they're individuals and they'll choose what to do with that. But then what we do know now is that now we've got the seed of Jesus, the word of God in our lineage somewhere that hopefully is going to continue to go down that line. It's not just about right now. It's about the impact we can have for generations to come. And some of those conversations that you guys have had with one another over coffee, you don't know what difference that could make in somebody else's life. You have no idea. So I hope when you leave church on a Sunday morning, when you leave our gathering, I hope that you go out there with a bit of a spring in your step. And I hope that you go, you know what, God, I'm just going to take a a, a punt here and just, just thank you by faith. That that conversation I got to have with that person, that Lord, you used that and you invest something in that person's life and you did something in that person's life and so on. Because we don't come here to spectate, amen? We come here to participate in what God is doing. Not everybody gets to stand up here with a microphone. Not everybody gets to be up there and, 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 and lead worship or play instruments or do chem- or, or whatever like that. But you know what? That is the most, that's the, the, the tiny part of it. The bigger part of it is life, how we live our life and the faith we carry outside of here and the faith that we have and the things that we do for God and the difference we believe we can make. And I, I just want to say all that to say that we're sitting here uh, in the place we are now because of so many more con- contributions than just a message and leading in worship. It's the contributions that you each make when you pray for one another. It's the contribution you make when you share for one, with one another. It's the contributions you make when somebody's going through a hard time and you cook them a dinner or you go around to their house and you with a trailer and you help them move or you do the things that you do. And so much of what you do is sight unseen. So much of what people do for one another in this gathering goes unseen, unspoken. But I just want you to know that we appreciate it. God sees it. And thank you so much because that's what makes a rise what a rise is today. Okay. Um, listen very quickly. Mark chapter 1, verse 32 to 38. We've been talking a little bit about distraction and how distraction is a big part of life today. Distraction is huge. We live in a, probably the most distracted uh, generation that there ever has been. And we've been looking for the last couple of weeks at distractions. And I want to kind of close it all out today by asking you to think about a question by asking you to pursue a train of thought and maybe some of you have done this, maybe some of you haven't, maybe uh, for some of you this will be the first time, maybe some of you have done it, maybe you've given up on the thought process. Well, I want to try to kickstart something again today if I can. In Mark chapter 1 verse 32 to 38, it says, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he wouldn't let the demons speak because they knew who he was. This is awesome. How many of you would love to have been there that night when that was going on? Jesus is there and he's healing the sick and he's casting out demons. We would call that today a massive revival, would we not? We would call that a massive revival. Healings and deliverances and all kinds of things. The Holy Spirit's moving and so on. In other words, Jesus is living the dream in one sense, I guess. It's all the things that we pray for, that we want to see, that we want to participate in, that we're believing for. It's happening right here for Jesus. And it's happening en masse. It's not just one or two. Uh, You know, we we can, our expectations, I think, today are so low that if, if, if somebody got healed of an ingrown toenail, we would think that that was revival. But God wants to do so much more in our world and in our time. We've become very scientific, we've become very analytical, and I'm into science and I'm into analytical, but I'm also into faith. And I believe that God, I say, I read this book and I don't see anywhere where Jesus rebuked anyone for having too much faith. But I do see him disappointed at people that had too little faith. So if I've got to go one end of the spectrum, I'm going to encourage people, have more faith, not have less faith. Don't be stupid, don't be dumb, and don't think because you have more faith you can control God like he's on some remote. It's not about that. But the more faith I have, the more opportunity I give God to do that which he wants to do. The less faith I have, the less opportunity I give God to do that which he wants to do. Don't judge me for it. Read the book, it's in there. God would go, Jesus would go into places where there was faith and he could do great things. There are other times where he went into places and it's very clear that there was very little faith there so all he could do was heal a few minor ailments. Now today, if, he, if, if we saw a few minor ailments healed here, we, I'd write a book, be on a speaking tour and we'd call that revival. But for Jesus, that was disappointing. 
I want to get my expectations where his are, get them up, I guess, out of the gutter, to so to speak, and start believing for things and expecting God to do great things. Because God is great. How great is our God? That's how great he is. He's a God that can do great things. But, but you know what? Over time, I feel like our expectation level drops. Every now and then we need a prod and a poke to just start believing God again. Amen? Am I the only one here that needs that every now and then? I need a poke to say, hey, come on, don't forget that even though he hasn't done it, he still can. So don't lose heart. Unless, of course, God's spoken and said, uh, hey, my grace is sufficient for you. But if he hasn't said that to me, then I want to keep believing that God can break through, that God can do, that God can set free, that God can heal, that God can bring that person to him, that he can take the blinders off that person's eyes, that he can raise that person up, that he can answer that question, that he can fix that problem, he can mend that marriage. I want to believe that unless God speaks to me and says, my grace is sufficient, I'm not going to change it, but I'll give you grace to manage it and to handle it. So many situations in my life, God hasn't said to me, my grace is sufficient. I've just gotten, my, my faith level has kind of just drop, drop, drop till before you know it, I almost have made a God in my own image. But here we are and Jesus is seeing all these things happen. In verse 35, it says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Isn't that awesome? Jesus, the son of God, felt like it was important to pray. I like that. I like that. If Jesus, who was the perfect, sinless Son of God, who was seeing all these great things happen, felt it was important to get up nice and early, undistracted, find a solitary place away from the ruckus and the noise and spend some time talking to his Father, if Jesus needed that, then I need it. I need it. Anyone with me? I need some time with God. I need to pray as well. But watch what happens. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. If I was Simon, I would be sitting Jesus down and saying, you're obviously overtired. You got up too early this morning and yesterday was a big day. You're not getting it. Remember, healings, miracles, deliverance, signs and wonders, people getting saved. Remember, that was only yesterday. Remember, remember, The people are back for more. And you want to leave. You're not hearing me, Jesus. There's a revival taking place here. And they want more. And Jesus says, "Eh, we're going to go. We're going to go. I've got other places to preach. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is is why I have come. That is why I have come. I want to ask you a question this morning. Why have you come? Not here. I know why you came today. There's brisket burgers afterwards. For the, for the 15s and overs, brisket burgers, sausage sangers, I was under, just had to do it that way because of the way things worked out. But, 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 but not why you're here today. Why have you come? You see, Jesus knew why he had come. And because he knew why he had come, he was able to live with something that we struggle with, I think. And it's called focus. Jesus was able to live a focused life because Jesus knew why he had come. He knew what God put him here for. And when you know why you've come, when you know what your purpose is, when you know what your focus needs to be, then you know how to prioritise your life. When you don't know what you should be focused on, it's hard to prioritise. Jesus was so focused on what he was called to do that he said no to participating in a revival. That's a focused man right there. That's a man that's living above and beyond distraction. So here's the reality. An unprioritized life is a distracted life. If you don't prioritize your day, how many of you know your day will be eaten away by distractions? Why did the distractions grab a hold of you so easily? Because you don't know what your priority is meant to be in that day. You go to work and you sit behind your desk and you don't know what the priority is today. 
So if you don't know what the priority is, you'll find your day slowly chipped away with distractions. And you get to the end of the day and you haven't achieved anything. You haven't hit any targets, reached a goal. Because an unprioritized life is dictated to by distractions. Jesus looked at this opportunity to stay in the middle of a... Think about this. The opportunity to stay in the middle of a revival for Jesus was a distraction. Because he knew what his focus was. He knew what he was meant to be doing. So he said, no, I'm not going to hang around here. Even though this is good, it's not the best. Even though this is a good thing, it's not building into what I'm called to do, where I'm called to go. How many of you believe that God put you here for a purpose and a reason? I believe this is one of the fundamental truths of our faith. That we're not just random blob of atoms and eons, mud and dust, that just happened to smash together one day. And by random chance, we grew gills and eyes that looked like strainers. And then one day, there were some superior fish that were just a little bit, could hold their breath a bit longer than the others and they crawled out on the mud banks and they stayed there long enough to start growing hands and feet and didn't pass out. That's amazing. And then as they got up onto their feet and wiped the mud off their nose, they turned to their cousins who couldn't get out and said, so long suckers, we'll be back to catch you for food. And they walked off into the distance. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, Doris Day, whatever will be, will be. See, I don't believe that whatever will be, will be. I don't believe any of you are here by random chance. And, and, and I'm not even referring to here in this building today. I'm talking about your life. The circumstances surrounding your life were out of your control. I remember in a heated argument one day, in a heated argument, my mother turning to me, and I love my mother and father, but I remember my mother turning to me in an argument one day and saying to me, why would you want to be with your father? He never wanted you anyway. But you know what? Whether he wanted me or not, God wanted me here. God wanted me here. I'm here for a reason. I've come for a purpose. And I believe that if you're in this room, if you're breathing God's air, whether you believe it or not, you are here for a purpose and a reason. And I think part of our journey as believers is discovering that reason. Why am I here? God, what is it? You've, you've given me this unique DNA. God, you've given me a personality. And the world can, tape, can tamper with that. You know, things happen in life. And who we are gets marred and scarred. But when we come to Christ, it begins this process of, of stripping away all that other stuff and, and, and helping us become again, discover the person we were meant to become. Discover the person God created us to be. He takes us on this beautiful journey of discovery, self-discovery. Not self-discovery as the world would say. From the world's perspective, self-discovery is just discover what you want have what you want. That's, no, no. Self-discovery is discovering the self that God created me to be. And getting back to that core. Because I have been given a personality by God. I've been given a set of gifts and talents. There are some things that to me were given to me by God because God fashioned me, custom made me to need certain things to do the thing that he wanted me to do. So he's put some gifts and some talents inside of me. He's given me a brain and a way to see things. How many of you know that, that, that quite often we see things differently? We, we have different perspectives about things. And that's not always bad. Sometimes that goes back to, to these innate motivators. We're motivated by different things. And it's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. Because the human race is a kaleidoscope of colours created by God. And we're put here for a reason. 
And part of our journey is, is, is getting to that aha moment where we go, I think that might be it, God. See, Jesus had that moment. He knew what he was here for. So when he was faced with a, what could have been a potentially massive distraction, Jesus was able to say, no, I'm not going to be distracted from that thing that you've called me to do, that thing that you've put me here for, because I know why I'm here. I know why I'm here. And when you know why you're here, when you know what you are called to focus on, then you're able to prioritise your life. You're able to prioritise your life. I believe we're called to live focused lives. You go back through uh, the Word of God and there are so many uh, stories of men and women that did great things for God. They were focused. Number one, they were focused on God. They kept God at the centre of everything and they lived focused on God. Uh, Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Everything else, everything else will come. Put God at the centre and everything else will come. I want to ask you that question this morning. Why have you come here? Maybe you haven't thought about it before. Maybe you're just kind of going through life, just going, well, I'll just do whatever, and hopefully I'll land there. And, and, and you know what? Here's the thing. I believe that God is so gracious and loving to us that he can direct our paths and he'll get us there. But I also believe that many of us don't know because we don't bother asking. We've never bothered asking God. The one that created you, the one that made you. And so the first thing I think we need to do if we want to live a focused life is we need to learn to ask God. You know, Jesus, it's interesting in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus first started preaching, first started his public ministry, it's interesting that he goes into a synagogue and he picks up what we would call a Bible and he finds in those pages what he's meant to do. He finds it in God. The Spirit of the Lord God's upon me because he's anointed me to preach. Heal the broken answer. He finds that, what am I here for? He finds it in the words of God. What God put him here for. A lot of people live for what they want to be here for. I've got my agendas. You know, I wonder sometimes with kids growing up, whether as parents, whether we are attuned enough and smart enough or know how at times to raise our children with a focus in the direction that God has for them or do we just raise them up in the way the world says it has to be? You have to finish year 12, you have to go to university, you have to, and I'm not against any of that. But I just wonder sometimes whether we don't help them focus. Just a thought. With ourselves. How focused are we? Anyone ever seen the movie City Slickers? One of my favourite films. Let me just rehearse a line for you. You'll all remember this. Curly. Curly says this, do you know what the secret of life is? This. And he holds up a finger. And Mitch says, your finger? Of course, Mitch is Billy Crystal. Of course, he would say, your finger. And Curly says, one thing, just one thing. You stick to that and the rest don't mean nothing. And nothing is my church edited version of the word he actually said. And Mitch says, but what is the one thing? And Curly smiles and says, that's what you have to find out. That's what you have to find out. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. You've been called according to a purpose that God has preordained for you. You're not random chance. You're not random chance. God called you for a purpose and for a reason. And I wonder how many of us are looking for that reason, but we haven't started at point one, which is, first of all, why don't we ask God what that reason is? He's not hiding it from us. Anyone ever done an Easter hunt? Anyone ever done an Easter hunt with the kids? You know, you get the eggs and you hide the eggs and the kids go chasing after the eggs. Anyone ever do that? Yep, oh, should I be saying that? Easter Bunny hid the eggs, whatever. So you hide the eggs, right? And the kids go looking for them. Or like Christmas time, we, our birthdays, we do this with our kids. We hide presents and we make them go and find the presents. We don't just give it to them on their birthday. No way. You, you find it. We hide them. 
But here's the thing, we're not hiding the presents or we're not hiding the eggs from them, we're hiding it for them. There's a difference between something being hidden from you and something being hidden for you. God's purpose for your life, it's, he's not hiding it from you. He's hiding it for you. And he wants you to dig in. He wants you to press in. He wants you to seek first the kingdom. He wants you to look. He wants you to pray. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to read. Because it's not that far from you. It's there. But he wants you to seek. He wants you to look. Start asking God this question, why have I come? If you want to live a focused life, ask God. What is your focus? Second thing I want to say is this. If you're going to live a focused life, you've got to learn to say no to good things. You're going to have to learn to say no to good things. Who believes that hanging around a revival for day two would be a good thing? I reckon hanging around a revival for a second day would be a good thing. But Jesus said no to a good thing so he could focus on the greatest thing, which was that which God called him to do. Anyone know the story of Mary and Martha? We always read the story of Mary and Martha and, and you know, Mary's sitting there, Mary's the good one and she's at the feet of Jesus and Martha's, it says that Martha's distracted with all of this stuff. Sometimes Martha gets a bad rap. Don't forget that culturally Martha was doing exactly what she was supposed to do. Culturally Mary was doing what she was not supposed to do. Culturally, when somebody came to your house, you, the, the host had to go out the front and they had to, to, with a bowl of water, and they would wash the guest's feet. Or at very least, give the guests a bowl of water so the guests could wash their own feet. And then they went inside and then the host's job was to go and prepare a meal. The female hosts were to go and prepare a meal while the male sat and chatted. So Martha is doing exactly what she's meant to do culturally. Exactly. Mary is doing the wrong thing culturally. She shouldn't be sitting there. She actually should be with Martha. Martha is doing the right thing, yet Jesus sides with Mary. See, what Martha was doing was good, but it wasn't the best. And if we're going to live a focused life, sometimes we've got to learn to say no to good things so that we can say yes to the best things. Sometimes we think decisions are all about right and wrong, good and bad. Most decisions you're going to make in a day are not about right and wrong, good and bad. They're about good and better. Most things are good. But what's better? If I really want to live a focused life, if I want to achieve the things that God wants me to achieve, if I want to make the difference down here that God wants me to make, it's not necessarily always a choice between good and bad. It's good and better. What's the better thing? What's the better decision that I need to make? Author Tim Ferriss, he, he explains it best in one of his books. He says this. He says, what you don't do determines what you can do. I wonder how much of my time and how much of your time is taken up on things that are pulling us away from the focus and the question, why am I here? Are they building into the why am I here? Or are they pulling away from the why am I here? Are they building into who God made me to be and what he wants me to do? Or are they distracting me from who I'm meant to be and what God wants me me to do. And the third thing, last thing I want you to think about, if you want to live a focused life, ask God what to focus on. Ask God what your focus is. Secondly, learn to say no to some things. And thirdly, start saying yes to a few things. I reckon we live in a generation where there are too many opportunities. Too many. When me and Jackie lived in India, I remember we came back to Australia and it was winter time when we came back to Australia. We flew back to Australia. When we landed, we landed in Sydney, got out the airport. Brother-in-law picked us up, drove us back to his house. And when we got to his house, brother-in-law had to go off to work. And so we were there and we had Caleb, our eldest son, who was in a, in a, a, a pram. And we had Johnny, two at the time, two kids. So we decided because, I mean, India, it's stinking hot where we were. We flew back in the middle of winter. So we decided we better go down to a shopping centre and buy a jumper because, you know, it's freezing cold here in Sydney. So we loaded up the pram and we're walking along the, the highway with the pram and we find this massive big Westfield shopping centre down there in Cronulla somewhere. And we go into the shopping centre and we go up the elevators and you can imagine, I mean, it's nothing like the shopping centres in India. It's just everything going on. And we walked down and we saw Target, the big Target sign there, and we marched towards Target. And I still remember we had the pram... We stopped at the entrance of Target and we looked up. And right in front of us was the ladies' winter section. And we stood there and we saw a hundred styles of jumper. 
30 different colours and, and, and materials. And we literally stood there and we just stared at it for about 20 seconds. And we got so overloaded, we turned to each other and said, I've got to get out of here. And we turned the pram around and we walked all the way back home, went into my brother's place, pulled the blind shut and just sat in the lounge room thinking, where are we? Too much choice is not always good for us. Too much choice is not a good thing. It can be overwhelming when there are too many choices. I think we live in a society today where we have been, we believe that freedom is something that freedom is probably not. The more choices we have, the more options we have, the more opportunities laid before us, then the freer we are. I think sometimes that cannot produce freedom, it can produce anxiety, it can produce uh, overload. Because we think we can do anything and be anything. And is that not the catch cry of today? Young people, you can be anything you want to be, literally anything now. And you can do anything you want to do, literally anything. There's no boundaries anymore. With all the borders, all the things that defined who we were or, or gave a bit of definition to life are being stripped down because we think freedom just simply means whatever you want, whenever you could. Isn't it amazing that the more free we're apparently becoming in society, the more anxiety and the more problems that we're facing? There's something comforting and safe about restriction. If you don't think so, pull a fish out of a bowl and say, you're free, and put him on the land. He's not going to thank you for it. Because guess what? That environment's going to kill him. He needs to live within a certain environment of restriction. And so do we. And the more we throw boundaries off, it's not helping mankind. It's confusing us. It's confusing us. Here's the thing. Let me, let me, let me make a suggestion to you. Instead of being anything you can be and doing anything you want to do, why don't you try to be the person God created you to be and do the thing that God put you here to do? I think it's a better option. Let's be the people that God wants us to be and let's do the things that he wants us to do. I'll get you guys up. We're going to finish with a, a happy birthday and a song. In Luke 10, 41-42, when Jesus is speaking to Martha, here's what he says. He says, Martha, Martha. By, by the way, whenever you read uh, in, in, the, in the Hebrew language, uh, when, they, when they repeat something, a name twice, it's, not, it's a term of affection. It's an affectionate thing. So, so Jesus is not, you know, Martha, I want to... You know, Martha, Martha, it's an affectionate thing. He's addressing her. But here's, here's what he says. He says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things and I think that's what many things do many things are not necessarily good you can't have a life that's about many things you'll only last so long you've got to narrow your life down what's it about what's your focus what are you here for he says you're worried about many things but few things are needed you see a focused life is about getting rid of the distractions and drilling down on who you are, how God made you, and why He put you here. doesn't mean you can't have fun. doesn't mean you can't... But you know what? Most people don't think about this till probably they hit around that. This is, I've been reading some research on this. Most people don't think about this till about midlife when they realise there's less days ahead of me than there is behind me. And when I read that, I thought, wow, I wonder what my life could have been if I thought about this earlier. All the wasted time I spent. All the wasted years. All the wasted opportunities. All the yeses that should have been no's. And maybe the no's that should have been yeses. Why? Because I didn't know what I was here for. So I couldn't build into that. I couldn't go down that path. So let me ask you a question. What are you here for? Why has God put you here? And if you don't know, then can I encourage you? Ask your heavenly Father. Your Father loves you. He doesn't want to hide it from you. He wants to tell you. Because a focused life is a fruitful life. 
an unfocused life is an unfruitful life. And I believe God wants us to bear fruit. I believe God wants us to make a difference. Why is this so important? I'll finish with this. Because we're living in a world right now where anything to do with God is getting so diluted. It's getting so diluted. To the point where most of us feel like it doesn't really matter whether I do or I don't. And that's a fatalistic attitude. I don't care how insignificant you think your life is. Focus it in the right direction. And you can make an eternal difference. You can make an eternal difference. Amen. I want to pray for us. And then we're going to sing happy birthday. And then we're going to finish with a worship song. Then we're going to go and eat brisket burgers that you've all been waiting for. So Father, thank you, Lord, for again the six years. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, I pray for every person in this room, every person in this room, God. God, give us focus. God, speak to everybody in this room. God, it's, it's, it's not about vocation. It's not about where we're living. God, it's not even about where we go to church. It's about how we live. It's about what we're doing with the time that you've given to us. So, Father, I pray for each person in this room, God, if there are people here and they don't know why they're here, if they can't stand with Jesus and say, I know why I'm here, then God, I pray you would begin to answer that question for them. God, begin to speak to their hearts. God, show them what you put them here for, God. Because Lord, we want to make a difference in this community. We want to make a difference to our neighbours, God. We want our life to count. God, we don't want to see the name of Jesus just be put on the shelf with other fairy tale creatures, God. We don't want that. So Father, raise us up, I pray. Raise up your church. Raise up your people. God, to get refocused. God, to prioritise the right things, to say no to the wrong things. Father, I commit everybody here to your Holy Spirit this week. Father, I pray as we go from this place that, Lord, you would give each of us a chance this week. God, we pray this every week and I wonder how many people take the opportunities. But Lord, I pray again today, God, you would open a door for us to tell somebody how good you are and that you would give us the faith and the boldness to step through that door and to pray for somebody or to share our personal story with somebody or to share the good news of the cross with somebody and to point someone to you. This week we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.